Ah, nosso segundo palestrante é Joy Ganani, do RDC dos Estados Unidos, com ah, a palestra Sediment Process Modeling and Management. I'm Joe Gilani. I spoke yesterday. For those of you who don't remember me, I'm from the ERDC in Vicksburg. I'm from the ERDC in Vicksburg, Mississippi. And I'm going to be talking about some of the sediment transport processes, uh, work that we do to support modeling, and some of the research that we have going on right now to develop models and process understanding. I'd like to start with some of our sediment transport issues that we're trying to address here. They include navigation, maintaining safe navigation, the effect of structures like set of siltation behind dams, uh, land loss and erosion. We have a lot of land loss in the United States, particularly in the Gulf Coast, and we're trying to address that. Uh, we believe some, a lot of that is due to anthropogenic man-made effects and we want to be able to uh, mitigate that where possible using engineering with nature. Uh, effects on species and habitats of sediment, as well as flood sedimentation, and dredging requirement, how we manage our dredging, minimize our dredging volumes, and manage our dredging requirements. A brief outline of my talk, I'm going to talk about the motivation for the research we're doing, and then some of the objectives some of the measurement systems that we're using that we've taken from research to application in the field, uh, some of what we call near-field models, which are dredging specific, specific to the dredging operation, and far-field models. And one uh, thing to show you right here is an example of a hydrodynamic model where the blue is ADCP field data and the red is uh, model results. As you can see, the model very well matched the eddy that was being formed. This is a macrotidal environment, and there's a point up here that creates an eddy, and that eddy is right in the port of Anchorage, one of our uh, medium-sized ports in, on the west coast. It's in Alaska. It's Alaska's only major port, only large cargo ship port. Uh, So some of the motivation for doing what we're doing is that data related to sediment fate and management purposes are limited, and we need to expand those data sets. We need to better understand the processes through collecting the appropriate data, both in the laboratory and in the field. And then we use the models and tools, the models and tools to permit us to extrapolate to conditions for which data are not available. It isn't to say that the data is already, or the model is always right, you have to make judgments there about the certainty that you have in the model, what it is telling you, what it's not telling you, um, and one of those things that we think the models are most efficient for is providing a framework within which to quantify faith, but also to assess options, to compare results from one option, this modification system versus this modification system, and compare our alternatives before we make a decision. And our motivation for increasing its budget and increasing the research that we're doing in sediment processes and sediment modeling is that the issues are becoming increasingly complex uh, related to sediment transport. This includes flood risk reduction, regulatory compliance, environmental resources, navigation safety and efficiency, and cost. Uh, and then the last three are really engineering with nature topics sediment or dredged material as a resource, use it beneficially, sustainable sediment management, how can we use our dredged materials such that we don't have capacity issues at our placement sites and such, that they're always being uh, depleted at a rate that we are nourishing them so we can um, use the same site over and over, and then engineering with nature in general. And models are only one of several tools applied, and I should emphasize that. The, uh, it's one line of evidence in a weight of evidence approach. So you're going to have other lines of evidence. Modeling may be your strongest, or the data may be your strongest, 
or you may just have conceptual site models built by talking to experts in the system, whether they be the people who navigate the system every day or uh, other experts. And you really need a suite of modeling tools, uh, various levels of models, and addressing specific processes, like dredge material placement and just the placement of dredge material. A model to do that to meet regulatory criteria, for example, is a specific model we have, and I'll talk about that. And our objectives are to develop and maintain a suite of tools, measurement tools, models, and databases to address issues related to sediment management. We need to develop the appropriate sediment process descriptions that are required within the models to be replicate sediment state or predict sediment state. And we need to improve the accuracy and the range of applicability of these models. We need increased interaction between models, databases, and tools. In the Corps of Engineers, uh, we've had a culture of independent research that often doesn't get put into an organizational framework the way it might be done, for example, where there is a private organization, so everything has to be done as efficiently. There's, we're a government org, so there's a lot of room for inefficiency. And <laughs> uh, it hurts us. It, it does, and we're addressing it. And I'm just being honest there. Uh, and as I mentioned, the tiered models, the screening level models, models that you can run a hundred times, a thousand times, and get statistical results, as well as those models, the complex 3D ones like the previous speaker talked about, that you're only going to be able to do a limited number of simulations with. And we need to decrease the time required for setup, application, and interpretation through efficient user interfaces and analysis tools. And this is a slide I developed to kind of show how things interact or should interact. We have our process studies up in the top left-hand corner, erosion potential, sediment fluid interaction, settling velocity, bottom boundary layer dynamics, going into our near-term algorithms, which we incorporate into mid-term models, which I'll describe models, which might be days to years, and our far field long-term models like the effects of sea level rise on elevation, sedimentation, will sedimentation keep up with sea level rise, what will it do to our wetlands, exposure models to species, uh, sediment budgets, sediment beneficial use calculators, and then we want to support flood risk reduction, effect studies, habitat, dredge material management plans, and feasibility studies. So why are we making these measurements? We need the measurements to understand how the mud and sand is moving through the system. They often move differently, so we need to be able to know whether we're measuring mud or sand, which is sometimes difficult when you're in the field. Um, we use these data then to develop algorithms or to develop parameterization methods that we incorporate into the transport models. And then we can evaluate transport after we modify a system, for example, add a jetty, add a dam, modify a navigation channel, how is that going to affect sedimentation? We're going to a lot of deep draft channels in the U.S. One of the studies that is most common for us right now is how will that affect, everything has to be economically justified in theory, it's government. Uh, so we have to say that this will increase our trudging requirements by going to, uh, by increasing the depth by two meters. This will increase our dredging requirements by 20%. Can we economically justify that with the additional cargo that will use that extra two meters of port depth? Those are the types of economic analyses that we have to do, and it goes right back to the sediment transport model as one of the major components. And what are the risks and benefits of changing transport patterns? And that goes back to engineering with nature. If we do it wrong, we could do more damage than good. And we want to know that beforehand. We want to know what the risks are and weigh whether those risks are worth uh, trying, weigh those risks against. And so what we're measuring includes sediment stability, sediment settling, including deposition and flocculation, 
sediment bed composition and consolidation, what's in the water column concentration of muds and sand, uh, and constituents, I should add, uh, sediment load and land loss change. And now I'm going to go through some of the measurement uh, methods and then I'm going to go through some of the models that we apply. So using data to support models, uh, we want to understand the site-specific sediment processes. So we want to do, be able to, if we're doing Mobile Bay, for example, an example I gave yesterday, and we want to understand the erosion potential of those muds, we want to study the erosion potential of those muds specifically. We want to take our apparatus down to Mobile Bay and do erosion studies there, and then take it to another location and do erosion studies there. Because although we know qualitatively specific properties of cohesive sediments might affect quantitative processes like erosion rate, we can't, we cannot, by measuring the properties like density, say what the erosion rate will be. We have to go in there and actually measure it. Um, we want to develop conclusions about system behavior. Um, we use the data to build and calibrate the sediment transport models and then additional independent data sets to validate the models and then use the models to predict conditions for where we have no data. This is McAnally's uh, sediment transport process schematic where sediment is lifted, picked up from the ground. It can be picked up either as an individual particle or as an aggregate, um, picked up, brought into the water column, can aggregate, flocculate, settling, can either break up and go back into the water column or erode again. So it's a rather complex process. Uh, this is supposed to be a video. It worked. And when we uh, when we tried it out on the upstairs, I guess it's not working now. The most. No, it worked this morning. <laughs> Anyhow, this is how we measure No, we're not going to get it to work. Okay. I'll do it without it. I'll describe what it what it looks like. Well, since most of you are from Brazil, you're not going to know what I'm talking about, but it looks like snow falling. Uh, <laughs> is the best way to describe it. It's just a settling of particles, flocks, and aggregates. This is a set system we actually insert into a dredge plume, into a turbidity maxima, into another, any other area where sediment settling that we're interested in. We look at the settling velocity and the diameter. Based on that, we can decide what the density is quantify what the density is, we can determine whether it's a flock, an aggregate, or an individual particle. And then we know what's in our water column and what its state is at any given time. That's one thing we use to help us parameterize the settling in our model. For erosion, we'll take a core from the area of interest, put it in this machine, this is set plume, which has been around for a number of years, developed by Dr. Willie Lick. Uh, uh, this was developed by Jarrell Smith at our laboratory. I, I shouldn't take credit for anything that's on this. <laughs> there are plenty of people who can take credit for it. And we've modified it and we erode layer by layer. And this is an example of erosion as a function of shear stress for a material that we cap. What we can see is that the erosion of the capping material is much greater than the erosion. The erosion potential for the capping material is much greater than the erosion potential for the underlying contaminated material. And we'll put that into the model to look at cap stability. Uh, 
Uh, we'd look at density and consolidation using X-ray diffraction, X-radiography, excuse me, and another video that's not working. We're looking at turbulence and sediment transport in uh, wave current environments. And what you would see is a wave coming over and these uh, stems moving back and forth. I could try this one on here, see if it'll work. Hmm. Again, it worked perfectly when we tried it this morning. That's okay. We'll, we'll, we'll do without the video. Uh, I don't see the video here. It, it was embedded. It was embedded, so... Pardon me? It, that, that one was embedded in the thing, so we'll just continue going on. Okay, I apologize for the glitch. And this is how we would use the uh, PICS, the settling velocity machine, we, the, a measurement device. We would use ADCPs to find out where the plume is, where the high intensity plume is. Using this, pick locations in the plume where we're going to quantify settling velocity, and then put our settling velocity mechanism down into these locations. And then I also put uh, what we're doing in wetlands, how we're using translating from the laboratory to the field in wetlands, using similar measurement techniques. We also measure sediment fluxes in rivers. This is the Mississippi River sediment flux at one of its junctions with the Atchafalaya. And you can see we do transect and quantify what the sand and silt transport across each of these transects is, and that way we know how the sediment's behaving in the system. And then we can take that and compare our model results to it to see if our model is working properly. Uh, measuring bed elevation and bed elevation change, fairly standard. We do that, including bed forms and the transport of bed forms, bed form migration down here through repeated transects. Now some of the models. Uh, we have web-based screening level tools and models which run in a matter of a second or two, and then our process-specific near-field models like SP fate, which is short-term fate of dredge material model, and our large domain far-field models, Lagrangian and Eulerian type models. ST-FATE of the short-term phase is, uh, provides deposition patterns and resuspension from placement of dredge material from a barge. Uh, it's used for regulatory compliance, water column concentrations specifically, and uh, this is a schematic of the processes that are included in the model. The door is open, there's a current, there's a dispersion of very low density material that's stripped, and then dispersion and impact, as well as a bottom transity flow. And all those are modeled in this model. Now, here I have a video. Any particular videos, I will show that one here. What that's showing is the lutriate concentration. And basically, we cannot exceed certain levels outside this boundary. So what we use, since this is a tidally dominated regime, is placed on specific sides during specific parts of the tide. Okay, we can go back now to the...
slide. And what we were able to do, demonstrate using that model, was to uh, demonstrate that we could use a 6,000 cubic yard barge and still meet water quality criteria if we placed appropriately versus a 3,000 cubic yard barge, which was the initial regulatory compliance. So that made the dredging operation more efficient. The MP fate model is just multiple placements, same as the ST fate except run multiple times, and it starts developing. This is the mound thickness in feet, pardon the English units, uh, blue being about two to four feet, red being 12 to 14 feet. This was a pit. We were able to uh, look at the mound configuration after placement using the model and compare that to the actual uh, mound configuration. And there was a concentration of placement where the bathymetry was deeper with the idea of getting a level top site so we'd have as much capacity when we went back to it the next time as possible. The PTM model is a far field dredge material transport model specifically designed to multiple, to, to simulate multiple scenarios. We couldn't use an Eulerian model for, we had to do a lot of different scenarios for dredging. Dredge size, dredge volume, type of dredge, uh, dredge material composition, density, percent sand, silt, clay. So get using an Eulerian model to model that gets to be a bit cumbersome, particularly when you want to look at the far field phase. So we use Lagrangian models or particle tracking models to do that. Um, and issues addressed include sedimentation, time varying sediment and constituent concentration, and dose estimates at the receptors. And then post powerful post-processing tools to help the manager uh, understand or process the results such that they can interpret them for what they need to use them for. And this is a tool designed not only to be used by your high-level modelers, this is designed to go out to the field users, to the engineers that work in our district offices, that manage, for example, the lower Mississippi River, and they use it in their division. Um, and a number of our district and division users, uh, engineers are using this model now. Another video that's not going to work is <laughs> this one that shows the particles moving through the system. It's just particles moving through the system. We're not going to move back to it. Um, and this is at a macro tidal inlet, and it has a lot of wetting and drying. This is the Knick Arm at the Port of Anchorage. And you can see that the processes include uh, deposition during wetting and drying and resuspension when it wets again. The model is best for dredge plumes that have the least amount of interaction with the sediment bed because the sediment bed particle interactions have the highest degree of uncertainty because you don't have all the other sediments in the system. You're only tracking the particles from the dredge itself. Um, the post processor includes contour plots, uh, this is uh, grams per meter square deposition. This is actually at Santos. This is a job we did at Santos about a decade ago now. There were some mangrove uh, groves and they wanted to see what the sedimentation would be on them during the dredging process and it turned out to be very little. Uh, and some of the uh, output includes uh, the contour plots and these Contour plots can be time variable. They can be made into movies and animations. Um, and time series data collected uh, at user specified points, looking at the time series of concentration or something from multiple hopper dredging operations. And then we can calculate dose and then use that as exposure estimates for effect models for species. And then our Long-term fate model is the Eulerian model, which is the equivalent Delft 3D. It includes sand and cohesive sediments, movement of all sediments in the system, uh, fully 3D barrel clinics, 
quantify the 3D hydrodynamics, uh, morphology change, time varying suspended solids, uh, the mass exiting the domain, the fate of sand, silts, and clays, and the bed composition change. And what we found with this model is right now it's a structured grid. We're converting it to an unstructured grid. And so it was very time consuming. And to model something complex like Mobile Bay here, you really need to model the entire Mississippi Sound, Mobile Bay, coast of Louisiana system. They all interact. So what we did was we made the model multi-block such that you have a block where you are modeling sediment transport. In this one, it's at Bayou Passat, which is this entrance channel. So we're only modeling sediment transport on this block, but we're modeling hydrodynamics entire domain. Um, and that reduced our computational time significantly within a structured grid model. Five minutes? OK. And this is the type of thing we look at. I'll just uh, go right down to the results here. What we were doing at BioCasat was widening and deepening the channel, and they wanted to know what their dredge volumes would be relative to their current dredging operations for various channel configurations. These are the channel configurations. This is the factor by which dredging would be increased in the BioCasat channel, and the Pascagoula lower sound channel. There's really two channel portions to this. And these are the kind of data we can give to our, provide to our clients, which tend to be our districts. And I think with that, to leave time for questions, I'll, with that, I'll, I'll, I'll end the, the talk. Oh, I still have five minutes. Okay. I,